Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for our 2021 Solidarity Town Hall. This year, the Town Hall is themed Imagining Decolonized Futures, highlighting futurist and sci-fi narratives as we imagine a world free of colonial concepts. This event is a kickoff of our season called Istakbal al Mustakbal, or Welcoming the Future. This means everything from futurist programming to sci-fi installations. And for all of us at the museum, we're really just envisioning ourselves boarding a ship that transcends through time and space to a new reality with new beginnings. My name is Fatma Rasul, and I go by she, her pronouns. I'm the public programming representative at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Before we begin, I would like to start us off with a belated Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. As I, and many of us, reside on stolen land, I am eager to dive into a conversation where every day is Indigenous Peoples Day, and that reality, one of community building, land back, and much more, is envisioned. On that note, I will ground us, even though we are not physically in the same space. The Arab American National Museum sits on Anishinaabe land and resides within the region with the highest concentration of Arab Americans in the nation. We also acknowledge our neighboring city, Detroit, as Anishinaabe territory and other indigenous people's land, and as being the largest majority black city in the nation with a long legacy of African diaspora contributions. Together, we also uplift and honor the indigenous and diaspora communities from wherever you may be tuning in from. As we get started, I'd like to read our anti-oppression statement in order to ensure that this is a safe space for everybody. In alignment with AE&M's commitment to creating an arts sector rooted in justice, we are committed to ensuring a space that is free of racism, transphobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, ableism, misogyny, classism, or other biases. Our expectation is that all guests will honor these ethics during our discussion and always. Now, it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Grace Dillon. 
Grace L. Dillon, who is Anishinaabe with family, friends, and relatives from Bay Mills Nation and Garda River Nation, and with aunties and uncles also from the Salto Nation, is a professor in the Indigenous Nation Studies Department in the School of Gender, Race, and Nations, and also affiliated professor at English and Women, Gender, and Sexualities Departments at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. She is a senior editor, along with editors Isaiah Lavender III, Taryn Taylor, and Borai of the upcoming Riddleage Handbook of Co-Futurisms, including areas such as Afrofuturism, African Futurisms, Indigenous Futurisms, Latinx Futurisms, Asian Futurisms, Gulf Futurisms, and BIPOC Queer and Disability Futurisms, which is forthcoming early to mid-2022. She has also edited and written several other books of Indigenous Futurisms. Grace currently serves on boards such as Ethno-ISS, the International Space Station, and IFA BIPOC Committee, and currently serves as Presidential Fellow for Future Collaboratories. Take it away, Grace. Mino mi tom bima diji giwig giji giga. Happy First Peoples Day, every day. Anin, I see the light in you. This very quick title of uh, this talk is called Nana Dawe, Go and Heal, Our Global Gido Du De Minigal Nig, Our Kinship System. Go and Heal, Our Kinship System. We have this past summer experienced 109 to 118 degrees Fahrenheit in our coastal and mountainous areas of Oregon, Washington, and Vancouver, BC, or the Pacific Northwest, where a family lives with most homes not constructed for any form of air conditioning and cooling centers created for urban peoples who often could not make it there due to the melted parts of our metro rail system broken down while power outages became the norm in the city of Portland. And so over 1,000 people died, while billions, billions, not millions, of sea creatures were exterminated in the deadly heat that lasted for a week and a half or so in early summer. Not too long ago, Hurricane Ida caused scenes like Holmes and Hammond and New Orleans, Louisiana, both flooded and on fire. The Huma Nation became absolutely homeless with the way it impacted their uh, nation land, their island. The power transmissions all went down while the same hurricane swung up into the Northeast and flooded the underground subway system and numerous people in the hundreds died as illegally rented basements with no outlet suffered from flash floods. The Midwest experienced deep flooding and tornadoes that drowned crops and the wildfires of the West Coast, especially perhaps the Calderon fire that has swept into a tourist hub of Lake Tahoe, created the havoc of trying to escape the flames. In one instance, school children were hastily evacuated across the street as their school went up in flames. In the midst of ICUs, hospital beds, and medical staff, overrun with largely unvaccinated Delta variant cases of COVID. Wildfire smoke has also damaged many human and non-human beings. Young kids are getting more and more admissions to the emergency room and the hospital with asthma exacerbations due to poor air quality, says Dr. Mickey Sokdeva, a pulmonologist at Kaiser Permanente in Fresno, California. We're seeing more heat exhaustion and heat related illnesses with climate change happening, the number of these cases will keep rising. The International Code Red Report, released this past August, revealed that temperatures have already risen two degrees Fahrenheit, with pockets of three degrees already in some areas. Reaching 3.6 degrees makes extreme heat events almost 14 times more likely. As we well know, the conditions of our Anthropocene are experienced unevenly and profoundly shaped by ongoing forms of colonialism, extractivism, and racial capitalism. Anti-racism, anti-colonialism, and anti-capitalism explored in depth 
by historian, black historian Ibram X. Kendi and philosopher Alexis Shotwell in Perspectives and Controversies in Anti-Racist and Anti-Colonial Anthropocene for Compromised Times, and The Red Nation in the Red Deal, Indigenous Actions to Save Our Earth, also, uh, they both came out in 2021, both suggest that the intensity and scale of climate crises require equally powerful and sustained responses by activists, school activists, and communities working side by side with scientists, artists, and creatives. I should mention that our word in Anishinaabe, Moan, uh, is the same for artist, writer, and scientist. And so we view indigenous sciences as always uh, complementing each other that way. For there is no neutrality or safe space, as there is also not for racism. It is either increasing racism or a struggling day to day to really promote and understand and process and live anti-racism. Growing up with his Aztec ceremonies, rituals, dances, language, and culture, Jutitz Cocktail Martinez, the executive director of the Earth Guardians, wrote at the ages of 16, 16 to 19, his amazing We Rise, the Earth Guardian's guide to building a movement that restores the planet. These impacts, um, such as that brought up by so many Pacific Islanders at this point, are felt globally. The Octru Glacier in Southern Siberia, a sacred site for the indigenous and self-sufficient Altai people as an elder, Oleg speaks of it, is the troublesome lack of respect for the spirits, or what he called bosses, of these sacred places by tourists. It reminds me actually of the story by Adrienne Marie Brown, The River, uh, in Octavia's Brood, that she and Walida Imarisha uh, both uh, edited. And a river becomes there a living being and exact some revenge on all of the white tourists that uh, liberal white tourists coming into Detroit and um, basically uh, ignoring, uh, making invisible 85% uh, of that Detroit community uh, that are black residents that have been there for generations and generations in many cases. In addition to the physical impact, the visitor's insolence leaves a heavy spiritual imprint on the land. When they leave, it is the local people who must deal with the consequences of their actions. This includes local shamans carrying out traditional ceremonies to restore the balance between local people, the glaciers, the mountains, and Altai. Ultimately, Oleg concludes, climate change is a symptom of people's ignorant actions upsetting the natural balance of life on Mito Kumikwa, Mother Earth. And I should mention that there are all kinds of articles being written now, especially in uh, South America and Latin America, uh, being translated from Spanish into English, where they've taken the Cree word Pimatizimon, or our Anishinaabe word, Bima Tizimon, which means living the good life, uh, to talk about the importance of that balance. And currently, uh, we are in so many ways experiencing what we call akosi, which uh, for many people refers to disease or plague, but lit quite literally means to be imbalanced. So many of us throughout the world globally we're feeling not only unsettled, we're feeling genuinely imbalanced in body, mind, and spirit. In the Altai traditional worldview, all natural things, whether plants or planets, bees or boulders, spiders or spirits, are recognized as conscious living beings endowed with all the functions, feelings, and follies of a person. For Oleg and his kin, Altai is a breathing and sensuous living entity, and Altai is the mountain in their area. 
with which they must keep their relationship in balance if they want to have a good life. And you'll see that refrain over and over again for BIPOC peoples at this point, uh, not just indigenous peoples globally, is that interest in keeping our mutual relations in balance with each other. If nature is not treated with reverence, reciprocity, respect, and restraint, the relationship becomes compromised, leading to environmental imbalance, such as our severe forms of climate change. I had the pleasure of seeing a quick screening of the upcoming feature length Indigenous Futurisms film, also queered, we'll re reference back to that again, Waikiki by Indigenous Hawaiian filmmaker Christopher Kahunahana, which is now out and available. Uh, and it describes the subtlety of our relationship to bodies of water. This appeals to me very much as a niche person, that's what we shorten ourselves to, uh, because waterways are extremely important to us. And often when I go places, I'll figure out actually the waterways to whatever place that I am visiting. Uh, and that's my way of mapping out uh, uh, the journey, you know, even if I don't go on all those waterways, where are they and where are they coming from? Umik E. Richard Atleo's Principles of Swak, an indigenous approach to global crisis, and he's talking about the climate again, which entails the Newt Chut Nolf Principles of Consent, includes sustainability, sharing, and the following of protocols through storytelling. Groundswell, Indigenous Wisdom and the Moral Revolution for Climate Change includes visionary ideas such as sharing the wealth, bending towards science and justice, spirituality and justice. As Larian Merkulif of the Aleut Nation suggests, when the leaders of all traditions open their hearts and minds to share their ways of sacred gatherings, all will begin to see the importance of the traditions and the gifts they carry like pieces of a puzzle put back together. We cannot see the meaning of one piece until all the other pieces are put in place. It is time now to bring your part, your piece of the puzzle, onto all the other pieces that are already put in place and will be put in place. It is time now to bring your part, to share in the great council of spirit that is mobilizing around the world. In 2012, we actually made a niche decision to start sharing not only our Geek and Dasaman, uh, plant knowledge and medicine knowledge, Mishkiki, our medicine, but also our Adazukanen knowledge, our sacred storytelling. And I was quite excited to see that Bryce Detroit is connected to a collective um, of musicians and activists and um, uh, what he calls entertainment justice uh, to basically um, share that sense of the sacred, um, sacred knowledge. Uh, another excellent source to take a look at is asserting native resilience. Pacific Rim indigenous nations face the climate crisis with speech that the, speaks to the practicality of farming with indigenous sciences such as creating edible food for us. We do that at our own farm as well. Uh, and I grew up with that uh, at Bay Mills and Garden River and our pacifist anarchist community uh, where we grew uh, our uh, three sisters and so many other uh, kinds of edible foods at the edge of our forest that we would have. Uh, and we didn't need to irrigate uh, or use water in that way. Uh, and tribe-friendly renewable energy policies. Uh, for instance, um, we have solar panels now at our Garden River Nation. The White Earth Nation now has solar panels. And I'm hearing suddenly of many, many other tribal nations following this method. Stories, films, video games, music, and art of indigenous futurism lately has been incorporating many elements of climate change and climate justice. And even as I looked over again, um, the stories of Gulf futurisms 
uh, uh, Palestine 100 plus as a collection, Iraq 100 plus as a collection, I was noticing also that subtle uh, weaving and interweaving of climate justice. And I should probably mention that for me, because you'll see many different definitions of climate justice, but for me, climate justice comes from the people and the communities uh, and then is shared with allies um, who may choose to join or help or learn from it. And so it's the BIPOC communities that are the most deeply impacted by both climate chaos and uh, environmental injustices. Those are the ones that it is important to have as leaders in uh, working through what climate justice really means. Uh, so I'm gonna um, skip a, a few things here and dash into um, stories of indigenous futurisms um, that are complemented or cross over when I read Gulf futurisms and of course when I read Afrofuturism. In fact, in Walking the Clouds, uh, I created the term indigenous futurisms as an homage to Afrofuturism and I make it clear there. Uh, because Afrofuturism started first. And now we have African futurisms, Gulf futurisms, Asian futurisms, Latinx uh, futurisms. Uh, uh, there's so many more. Um, and they're often interwoven with uh, CRIP or disability uh, futurisms and LGBTIQ2+, 2 plus, 2 plus standing in for two spirit. Uh, and those are very, very uh, often woven in together. Australian Aboriginal film, Kindred, and other works such as where Wayne Blair's TV series called Clever Men is Indigenous futurism centered. And by that I mean with a centering of Indigenous communities. That's the same, of course, for Afrofuturism uh, being Africana centered. African futurisms being African centered, Gulf futurisms being Arabic, Swana, uh, and the other terms, uh, all of that centering those communities. Um, their hardships and their celebrations are foremost in the narrative. And the important thing for us, and I was seeing this also with the Palestinian uh, and the Iraq afterwards and comments about it uh, by the editors that um, we are always planting ourselves in the front, we're foregrounding ourselves. And part of that delight and joy is the recognition that, for instance, with Nakba, you could set your um, science fiction collection 100 years into the future, right? Or with the BIPOC climate uh, stories that's now being published by Grist and Fix, and I was very fortunate to be a part of that. Um, amazing, amazing stories. They too are always centering whatever community it is that they're talking about, like uh, trans people that turn into uh, shells and coral reefs and start merging together in very fascinating kinds of ways. Uh, and all of that um, is the importance of realizing that we will be visible in the future, not invisible, uh, and uh, that we will be helping to genuinely restore and sustain our Mitsukumekwa, our Mother Earth. Uh, which needs a great deal of healing along with us. Um, so recentering indigenous science becomes important. Uh, as Gregory Cajete talks about it, indigenous science is high context as opposed to low context with your Western science. And by that, he, uh, this Tewa Indian of the Pueblo Nation, he's not at all, um, interested in, well, 
I should take some time to say this, but um, he's interested in promoting, let's say, the thousands and thousands of years of generations um, that have lived in areas, even if they were forcibly dispossessed and removed, uh, like the Cherokee or like the Palestinians uh, currently in Gaza and elsewhere, all of those kind of moments of displacement means that you are relearning uh, your indigenous science and that what is important about indigenous science, what makes it high context rather than low context, is that you are always accompanying your science with art, with stories, with ceremony and dance and song and all of that uh, and, and creating new wording in your languages uh, as you adapt and change to uh, new innovations that are also created simultaneously. We are dynamic and flexible and we love to adapt to that sort of thing. Uh, and so I think of, in that sense, Nello Hopkinson's novel, The New Moon's Arms, illustrating that kind of dynamism of an ever adapting tradition of a Maroon and Taino grandmother who shares her ancestral scientific knowledge while also excitedly learning from the sciences that her grandson is exploring in school. Uh, in our tradition, I was taught as a real little one uh, that we are all ever changing and dynamic as the Buguin, the drifting of the currents of the river, water, streams, lakes, and oceans, drifting in a slow but ever changing pace. Now, I want to switch over very quickly to uh, decolonizing, decolonizing the Anthropocene, which occurs in Afrofuturism, Gulf Futurisms, and Indigenous Futurisms. And one, there's so many features, but one thing that I think really stands out is recognizing that although scientifically the Anthropocene following the Holocene is often geographically given as part of, you know, the later parts or mid to late part of the 19th century, with the Industrial Revolution, uh, for indigenous peoples, um, we have been displaced from our own Aki land and our Nibi water relatives, such as Zibi River, Zibin Stream, Dibiki Spring Water, and Jaigan Lake, and so many other waterways we have protected for thousands and thousands of years. Um, the latest discovery, there was a scientific discovery that just came up about finding uh, human footprints in the Pacific Northwest that are 20,000 to 25,000 years old. So it's getting closer and closer to our sense of from time immemorial. Indigenous peoples in the Americas, North, Central, South, Latinx have already experienced with a highly disruptive and yet quite a short time period, colonization, imperialism, the early to later stages of capitalism and heavy industrialization that's led to deforestation, blocking of waterways dammed up and redirected, radicalized weather patterns with the decimation of animal nations, such as the buffalo brutally killed by frontiersmen, shooting heedlessly from the newer transportation of coast to coast railroad system. Um, and this, these scenes are actually shot in a film, Dead Men, to reflect this truth. Where millions of buffalo were left unused in huge piles with the hope of displacing further and even ending as many tribal people's lives as possible, who carefully used their giving Nawagadajig, four legged animal relatives, for sustenance, while leaving many buffalo peoples to graze in their specific ways that caused the grasslands to resurge annually. Later, of course, the methods of cattle and sheep ranching and the monocultural method of plowing land for crops gave way to an increasing land of waste, uh, fierce tornadoes and windstorms of great havoc, later called the Dust Bowl, as soil that had been tended for so many thousands of indigenous generations were stripped from Aki the land. I also want to mention it is just important to recognize um, not just the displacement of peoples like Palestinians and indigenous peoples, but also the horrifying, horrific enslavement of black peoples that uh, were brought 
in horrific conditions uh, across the Middle Passage for many, many, many decades. Uh, decolonizing the Anthropocene is also about determinizing forms of climate and environmental justice, always integrated with racial and economic justice, and globally sharing our values and science systems that mutually honor our Mother Earth. In our Anishinaabemowin language, the closest that we come to the expression nature is anim, which actually means normal, uh, or gojin, outside. In other words, the waterways, sea, and land circle in unison with the skies. All must share, move, and recalibrate for the good of the common pot, as Abenaki Nation Lisa Brooks suggests. Now, not just regions and local areas, but our entire planet is a common pot that must be shared with all of our relatives, whether animal persons or nation, plant persons or nation, rock persons or nation, bird persons or nation, even phenomenal logical persons or weather events, now more in line with global weirdings, such as fire tornadoes, tornadoes, sorry, um, severe floods and fires simultaneously that occurred during Hurricane Ida. There was incredible flooding while simultaneously homes were on fire. In the Palestinian 100 plus, Basma Galilini, the editor of the collection, writes in her introduction that science fiction has never been particularly popular for Palestinian authors because, quote, and this is how we indigenous people felt about it too, it is a luxury to which Palestinians haven't felt they can afford to escape, unquote. Salim Harad's Song of the Birds and Another Headache-Inducing Day at Gaza has a point where time passes more slowly by the sea. And the girl who is noticing this learned in physics class the hands of the clock placed at sea level run a fraction slower than those of a clock placed on a mountaintop. And so she feels a prisoner of both history and time. Quote, the sea, warm and inviting, seemed playful that day, licking the sides of her face. But underneath this playfulness, she felt something more sinister. And this story to me reminds me very much of many Afrofuturist stories um, that are using the allegories of the middle pass passageway so that what seems to be beautiful on top can become very sinister um, as you were traveling through. She imagined blue water swallowing her, dragging her deeper until her body hit the seabed to join the thousands of bodies that had drowned in these waters throughout history. Now this, by the way, is set in a time uh, that is much further along in the future. Lost in a world of simulation and in the imprisonment of ancient forms of nostalgia, her dead brother in an olive tree embedded dream cautions her about the arsenal in Israel that they are using, the latest technology to, quote, shore up and further advance the occupation, unquote. And his, her brother asks her, how is it logical that Palestine was so easily liberated? In fact, it was not. In this story, the adults sleep while the younger generation awakens, as her brother notes. Quote, we are the first generation to have lived our entire lives in the simulations. We are at the frontier of a new form of colonization. So it's up to us to develop new forms of resistance, uh, i.e. to counter the right to digital return. The Song of the Birds, which is the title of the story, are looped over and over and over again, and this is what gives away the simulation. And as the sister starts to figure this out, she feels stuck between two radio frequencies, between navigating dream and real life. And the two worlds converge, but they also for her become a third dimension, quote, a nightmarish conglomeration, unquote. This Palestinian story is linked to the many uses of black fugitivity seen in black feminist critics that use the ocean, sea, and waterways to, in this case, overgo the horrific nightmares of the Middle Passage and, and to release Black optimism about the potential return, or as we say in Anishinaabemowin, biska beyond, a return to ourselves. 
more literally in our language, a return to the woods and forests because we're often in the bush. Um, and the decolonization about waking up to the need for resurgence and the land back movements that Chelsea Vowell and others speak of in the Indigenous Futurisms podcast, uh, Métis and Face, Space, Métis and Space, not only fictionalized with future stories, but also realized in their lives with 10 acres gifted from this land back movement. Poetry who are BIPOC artists uh, and also LGBTIQ2 plus um, also formed, formed a community after their poetry and performances that they gave worldwide. And I was fortunate to see them in Amsterdam and also to be able to invite them to our campus. Um, and they were given an unexpected gift of land back with a hundred acres that was willed to them uh, in northern New York State, living sustainably and ecologically with BIPOC community members generously invited in. Quote, the cruel present and the traumatic past have too firm a grip on Palestinian writers' imaginations for fanciful ventures into possible futures. You see that as a recurring theme. You know, do we have time to write these kind of stories? Are these forms of escapism? Or do they actually become Atazukanan? And do they actually become indigenous science embedded in a way that, oh, well, as Bruce would say, that would be entertainment justice. I just love that term he uses. Um, not that the disguise of science fiction would be that drastic a costume change for Palestinian writers, especially those based in Palestine. Everyday life for them is a kind of dystopia. A West Bank Palestinian need only record their journey to work or talk back to an IDF soldier at a checkpoint or forget to carry the, their ID card or simply look out of their car window at the walls, weaponry, and barbed wire plastering the landscape to know what a modern totalitarian occupation is, something people in the West can only begin to understand through the language of dystopia. And this was uh, uh, an interview from The Guardian, uh, Thursday, July 25, 2019. A Leaf the Unseen by G. Willow Wilson, 2012, a former Egyptian journalist who really covered the Arab Spring uprisings to a great degree, continues also with uh, queering, not just Gulf Futurisms, but queering in the Ms. Marvel series when she stepped in to cover an absence of um, a well-known uh, writer and artist. This heroine has become such a hit that many more volumes on Ms. Marvel uh, has come out. Ibtisam Azem's The Book of Disappearance, 2019, poses the question, what if all the Palestinians simply disappeared one day? In Tel Aviv and Jaffa, Allah, who converses with his walked-on grandma in a journal he left behind when he disappeared and is haunted by her memories of being displaced from Jaffa and becoming a refugee in her own homeland. What is it like to continue to live in a stolen country and Aki land? Hassan Blossom, who edited uh, Blossom, who edited Iraq Plus One Hundred in two thousand sixteen, is also interested in taking the fiction out of science fiction, as Helen Hague Brown from the Chicoctin Nation in British Columbia has called it, for her own indigenous spoken indigenous film. It's all in Chicoctin, and the subtitles are in English. The Cave, and it resembles the pattern of raw pages afterward of Iraq 100 plus who suggests that the allegories of the future still are quite concerned with one's own time, such as the consequences of 2003, which are at the forefront of the reader's minds. Quote, it is also an invitation to construct positive visions of Iraq's future, stories of hope and speculations on what long-term peace and self-determination might look at, look like. The ability to present contemporary times, such as the fallout from 2003, quote, even if it meant dressing them up in the shiny future dress of science fiction, is his expression. Um, these stories written for this collection were mostly written before June 2014, 
when Mosul fell to ISIS and a new war spread its shadow across the country. And of course, we've had further histories um, uh, for those who have been uh, very badly affected uh, during our Trump regime. Uh, and the very existence of Iraq as a distinct sovereign entity had become uncertain. It also provides glimpses of a different Iraq from that voiced and illustrated in global media with the quote, original ambitions of the country's capital founded by Khalif al-Mansur as the city of peace, one of the great scientific aspirations of the Brown city and its house of wisdom realized genuinely one day. Uh, and with all of that in mind, since I think I've run over a little, <laughs> uh, I was just going to mention um, that <laughs> this may be a sign to end here. <laughs> ah, yes. In fact, I'm going to stop. I went way over. This was, you know, <laughs> so I will just say, let us all um, move together in unison as BIPOC communities and as co-futures, uh, sharing our knowledges with each other about the value and respect, the mutual respect that we have for our lands. Um, and let us envision a time, uh, as in the Imagine 2200 Grist contest uh, during climate change and uh, climate week that just happened, what, a week ago or so. Uh, sharing that knowledge, um, not just for allies, for self-determination always for ourselves, but at this point, to share this kind of generosity and radical love uh, to help and aid all peoples around the world, not just our black and brown communities, but all peoples around the world. Shane McGretch, thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. That was so incredible and so enriching. And I know I'm more than eager to hear our panelists respond. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our brilliant moderator, Hannah Baruch. Hannah Baruch serves as a Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Sustainability, Data Analytics and STEM Education Communications at General Motors. In her current position, Hannah's work has focused on policies within the community that advance diversity and en environmentally positive programs and policies. Ms. Baloch played a crucial role in the development of the Smithsonian Science Education Center's Zero Barrier in STEM Education Project, cultivating STEM learning for students with disabilities, as well as the International Society for Technology and Education's Hands-On Projects AI Learning Guides. Hannah has previously worked in the bilateral trade and diplomacy field with a British government organization focusing on trade, education, and diplomatic ties between the UK and Central and South Asian countries. Hannah has also worked as a quantitative and qualitative researcher in the international development field with Brookings Institute and Results for Development in Washington, D.C., focusing on education, child protection, and public health in the Middle East, African, and Eastern European countries. In 2021, Hina was named to PR's Week's Dash Dashboard 25 as one of the most influential people in communications technology. She is a re recipient of UNESCO's International Development Fellowship at University of Pennsylvania and Fulbright Huber H. Humphrey Fellowship at Penn State University, and has a specialization in statistical methods for psychometric testing from University of Cambridge. Hina has also served on the State of Michigan Gover Governor's STEM Advisory Board between 2017 through 2019 and serves on the Advisory Board of All for All and Smithsonian Science Education Center National Advisory Board. Uh, on a personal note, Hina has been such a champion of ours uh, and instrumental to our season of Stakhbal and Mustakhbal and this town hall, of course. So something that's just so we're deeply appreciative of for her help and her work and her support. And it's with great pleasure that I pass the mic on to her. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you for that great introduction. Appreciate it. 
Um, I hope uh, everybody who's listening to the town hall right now, I hope Grayston's keynote gave you a lot to think about. It really gave me a lot to think about um, as well. And I'm very pleased to be here and to be welcoming our guests to the Solidarity, Solidarity Town Hall on imagining our decolonized future. Uh, we have with us Bryce Detroit. Uh, Bryce Detroit is a multidisciplinary Afrofuturist music producer, performance-based storyteller, curator, act activist, and the pioneer of the concept of entertainment justice. And we'll take some time this evening to talk a little bit about this concept of entertainment justice uh, with Bryce Detroit. Uh, Bryce Detroit is a 2020 Harvard University Council of Arts Award recipient, a 2020 Transforming Power of Fund awardee, and a 2019 New Museum Idea City Fellow. We're also joined by Lisa Jackson. Lisa is a Toronto-based Anishinaabe filmmaker whose documentary and fiction films and VR work have garnered two Canadian Screen Awards and have been nominated for Webby and screened at top festivals, including Sundance and South by Southwest. She also worked, um, she's also been awarded the 2021 Documentary Organization of Canada's Vanguard Award, and she's also an ISO MIT Fellow. We have with us our uh, finally Selma Dabar. Selma is a British Palestinian writer of fiction. Selma was born in Scotland. Uh, Selma has lived in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, France, Egypt, and the West Bank. Her first novel, Out of It, set between London and Gaza and the Gulf, was listed as Guardian Book of the Year. She has also written radio plays, The Brick, for BBC Radio 4. She's written short stories published by Granta, Telegram, and International Pen. So thank you to all the panelists for joining us this evening um, and, and giving us your, your time and talking to the audience here. I'd like to I'd like to go back to uh, Grace's talk for a bit because I found it very 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 thought provoking. It took me took me to to many different places. Uh, there's a lot of complexities that Grace Dillon packs in the talk. Uh, Grace refers to the ideas of displacement, climate change, radical weather weather patterns. She talks about racism, colonialism, decolonialism. She talks about native resilience. She talks about community. She talks about reciprocity. Um, and we're in the company of artists today. Uh, and art has the ability to hold all of these uh, complexities. So I'd like to start by asking this question first, that how can art and all of the futurisms that we are talking about, African futurism, Latinx futurism, uh, indigenous future, futurism, LGBTQI2 plus futurism, how can all of these futurism and art engage with the complexities and dislodge the dominant colonial narrative uh, that we see around us? I ask this question and then I also ask myself that is that even a fair question? Should that even be a burden that we put on art and the artists? And is that making art and the artists too, too di didactic? But I leave that uh, to the panel here to respond to. would love to jump on that <laughs> piece. Anna, thank you for moderating. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is this. One is the role or responsibility as artist contextualized from an ancestral or ancient diasporic African perspective. In that context, the artist is one who is responsible through producing material culture, responsible for creating the modalities that inform and inspire self-identity, as well as help, help people to determine and design the way they want to interact with their built environment. So coming from that perspective and me choosing to root my practice, my entertainment justice practice in that my entire career, then that brings about one, a different vantage and orientation um, with your career. For me, from that point, my career is one of service, first and foremost, and it's of service to one self, um, <laughs> all of the ways that we personally want to aspire, we need to be using our craft as tools and a vehicle for self-development first and foremost 
but then second, um, using our art, using our craft as a mechanism to support humanity in whatever way that speaks to our heart the most, whatever we desire, the change we desire to see the most. So just saying all that to say, um, to set it up from this perspective, yes, art has the ability to uh, help people reimagine the way that they actually want to interact with the environment, help us to reimagine the way that we orient or may want to orient with the environment. And then from there, we can be inspired to re really be inspired to see ourselves as having agency and then responsibility for the environment. Hi. Um, so that was a fabulous talk and thank you for the introduction, Hannah. Um, yeah, what I would say, uh, you know, it's interesting the way you put the question uh, at one point uh, we were hearing in the keynote how, you know, within an Anishinaabe context, art and science are not separate. And I'm an indigenous artist. Um, I do tend to make works that uh, intersect with the science world as well. But I do think one of the things that really resonated for me was the decentering of a narrative that even divides out uh, realms of human interest or intellect from uh, art or storytelling. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that uh, I believe is that there is a, you know, our self concept, and this is given in part, I'm not a indigenous language speaker. I don't speak my mother's language. Uh, I only speak English. But I know enough about uh, my mother's language and other indigenous languages to understand how much our self-concept is given by the language we speak and how different a world we would live in if I did speak Anishinaabe Moan, for example. And one of the things that I've come to learn and why I'm so passionate about including languages in my work is that I think they're uh, like uh, sci-fi and the different futurisms they allow us to think outside the constructs that we almost like fish swimming in water. We don't realize uh, the social constructs that we're in. And so through art, we're allowed to uh, play and create uh, new contexts that can shake up our place in this world and our value systems, which can go in all sorts of directions, of course. But um, uh, one thing I would say is that uh, what I was picking up from that talk and what I've concerned my, some of my work about is two of the biggies that uh, kind of get addressed, I think, often in uh, sci-fi and futurisms is ideas of time and place. Uh, we can kind of play around with those. And loosely speaking, and being very general, because I don't want to take up too much time off the top, but I feel like, uh, you know, from my perspective in Euro-Western society, there's a, there's a, we privilege time over place or space. And uh, specifically the idea of time as a very linear, um, sort of an enlightenment ideal. We go from a more primitive past and we move forward into a more advanced technologically sophisticated future. And humans are as well going along a trajectory to being more sophisticated and more perfect in a way. And this flies in the face of uh, many cultures, uh, especially indigenous cultures, where oftentimes we think of time as cyclical and that we have a role in relationship with the rest of creation to kind of uh, renew cycles. And so that there's a wheel of time. Uh, and in fact, what is often privileged, and I won't get into the nerdy details, which I can, uh, but in our languages, very oftentimes it is senses of place that are privileged. And that uh, embeds us and it embodies us with a responsibility to all that surrounds us, rather than putting us in a more kind of conceptual space of moving along a timeline, which we now know even scientifically, uh, you know, that time doesn't exist. So uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Hi um, everyone. Thank you for the, the for the keynote and for including me on this panel. It was really um, I drew a lot on everything that's been said so far. I mean, coming at it from um, somebody who who started off uh, with short stories and novels, which were not kind of futuristically based. This is something which is a kind of new dimension to me. I think that fiction in itself has a 
you know, just in the way that it um, dwells on the intensity of lived experience, it can shift, um, it has a decentering, it centralizes the narrative around people on the fringes who are often of, of society who are often not as uh, acknowledged. And there's a political statement in that in itself. I think when you take it, for me, this shift into looking at futures uh, was something that kind of, uh, I was very much influenced by a decolonizing architecture exhibition that I went to about 10 years ago, where the um, E.L. Weitzman who ran this exhibition, he was talking about how they were taking structures in the West Bank and looking at how they would appear like Israeli settlement structures if, you know, if this land was turned back to the Palestinians, you know, turning like a watchtower into a skate park or, and they'd modeled these, these, these things very, in a very complex way. And for me, I was looking at them and thinking, well, this isn't going to happen. Why are they wasting this money on it? And I realized how blocked I was becoming in my own head as to the potentialities of the future, how much I was thinking that there are limits that we can work with and we have to sort of be realistic in our expectations. And I, when I was invited to um, write for Palestine 100 and a short story, it was so liberating in a way to be able to imagine these futures however way that I wanted and to use trajectories of development which you were hoping for. So for example, I was thinking that maybe things like blockchain technology, which would bypass perhaps the international banking system could allow for a new economy into places which are under siege like Gaza. But what I found within the collection when it was put together and we didn't have sight of each other's work when we were we were writing these pieces is that even though some of us were, you know, envisaging these, you know, better futures or, or more positive results, that a lot of us, and particularly the stories based in Gaza, we still had a siege going on. Now, this siege is rel relatively new. It's about, I mean, it's 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 a very long term, very brutal siege of land, sea, air, but it's been going on since two thousand and seven. So, but yet we were still thinking, okay, jump another ten years ahead, and it will still be in place. So. It's it's interesting how as as an artist you have to constantly be pushing against the, these these uh, restrictions, um, and I think just from the Palestinian position because we were said not to exist at all. Part of the Zionist mythology was that this was a land without a people, or that even if there was a people, that you know that they were so corrupt and nomadic that it, they didn't count as such. But a lot of work of artists originally and writers was just to be to write memoir, to reclaim our past, to, to say we were actually here because the villages were all destroyed. So I think this movement into the future is, is very liberating and filmmakers have, have taken it on board. And I think it's a, it's a very important space for us to go into. Although a lot of works have been very more on the bleak, dystopic side of like warning signs as to where we shouldn't go or where we might end up. I think there have also been some very creative, positive voices coming through. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those great answers. And I'm quite pleased with the panel that we have today also, because I do think with all of your experiences and correct, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel that uh, Bryce uh, Detroit, looking at all of of your work, I feel that your approach to art is, is, is a didactic one. And Selma, you look into the past and into the future. And Lisa, you bring a lot of technology uh, into, into the art that you do and the work that you create. Um, so thank you for those answers. Um, I'll come back to Bryce uh, here. Um, and Bryce, as I look at your work, there's a strong connection to place. Um, your, your, your last name here is the city of Detroit, so it'll be good for our viewers here inside and outside of Detroit to hear more about that. And I was uh, going through the lyrics of the songs that you have in Structured Water, and each of the lyrics focuses on the city of Detroit uh, with a vision to build, as you say, a hyper-local uh, music economy. Um, and, and your approach towards entertainment reminded me, I just finished reading uh, uh, this, this this poetry collection by Natalie Dias around, uh, Diaz around um, it's called Post-Colonial post Love Poems. And uh, she talks about, I'm reading one, one sentence, one line here from her first poem that says, uh, there are wild flowers in my desert, which take up 20 years to bloom. 
And then it kind of took me to this, you know, this sort around the hope in Detroit, the idea that Detroit can be the hub of entertainment, can be the hub of art, is the hub of entertainment, is the hub of art. Mm -hmm. And uh, Natalie considers uh, desert as a place of abundance and uh, river as a place of generosity. And I see a similar tone when you talk about entertainment and pop culture within the city of Detroit. And then also, I would also want to hear a little bit from you about uh, this continuous theme in your work around entertainment justice, mm -hmm. a term that I hadn't heard before connecting with you and connecting with your work. So talk to us a little bit about this idea of your connection with the land, uh, your last name, uh, Detroit, and then also this idea of entertainment justice that you're pas so passionate about. Boom. So want to start with this. Um, my identity on a cultural ancestral level do identify as a Detroit African. Now created this phrase for myself 2012. It was my way on my own journey of decolonizing, which is one part, and then ancestralizing, which is a whole other part. Um, just naming that, but I'm on the ancestralizing path. For me, it became an imperative to create a basically a mnemonic device, which will serve as a, pro, a programming mechanism of this, of a point of identity that acknowledges my indigeneity to Detroit or Wauwatanam, but colonially known as Detroit, because in real life, my family, we're four generations deep now. So it means something to really be native to a place, even in a modern context, but also acknowledging that Bryce is in fact a part of a multi, multi million year continuum, diasporic African ancestral legacy um, that is very real and is, is recorded in material culture, which still exists on the earth. And that point of identity exists outside of the settler colonial narrative outside of that book. Um, so just want to put that on a record. From there, we'll say this. It was an intention for me on a as a professional artist to embed Detroit in my name because, and this is me as a narrative broadcast strategist intersecting with a brand agent being a cultural brand agent, so to speak. Acknowledging that Detroit for all of my life has had a particular negative stigma around the diasporic African or black population. It is a real thing for, it's one thing to have this inherent uh, pride that comes from the grit and comes from the industrial the, the social conditionings that happen from being in an industrial city like Detroit. Like, yeah, it's one thing to have pride in that, yet it's another thing to have pride in the fact that in our DNA are is the legacies of the greatest social, creative, and technological innovations that have come from this city. So what does it really look like to be a product of the city? Well, this is a product of the city. A lot of the narratives want to say that products of Detroit, especially black products of Detroit are a criminal product or a product of a particular um, educational class, socioeconomic background. It's like, fuck all that. You feel me? Like this is what Detroit looks like. So that's, that's where the name, <laughs> the intentionality around the name. Uh, so boom, connection to place, entertainment justice, um, what's coming up for me to speak on is this. How about this? I'm gonna read, I'm gonna do something for the first time that we've never done on the panel and read a little statement about entertainment justice because we have a cute paragraph. Boom. As a media-based cultural organizing strategy, uh, entertainment justice is a, well, entertainment justice is a media-based cultural organizing strategy that utilizes new entertainment arts media, as well as public programming to organize cross-generational artists, activists, designers, 
residents, community advocates, and cultural producers to uplift and promote positive points of diasporic African and indigenous identity, lifestyles, ancestral literacies, new cultural narratives, and self-determined grassroots economies. So Detroit, this is the connection entertainment justice to place. Detroit has an economic and industrial economic legacy of being a recording arts and sciences city. Now this stems back to the early 20th century, like 1910s, 1920s. We're talking about rockabilly. We're talking about country music. We're also talking about um, one of the industrial recording capitals in the world in the top of the 20th century. So all of the, welcome to Henry Ford. This is an assembly line. Like all of those corporate videos, like corporate audio dub overs, we recorded the majority of those in Detroit. So that's one thing. The, the economic infrastructure, the recording arts industry was so robust and significant in Detroit that an actual black and brown music industry could come from it, can be birthed from that environment. One that was actually creating quality of life um, and wealth that was rivaling the auto industry at different points in the 20th century. So it is a very real thing when we are, so one, I'm gonna say this, one, it's a very real thing for the cultural economic legacies of our people in place that lives in buildings that like physical structures that lives in the bodies and the blood and the voices of generational residents what happens when we're faced with which the gentrification as a climate justice issue um the climate what is the actual social, cultural, social, political climate in our neighborhoods. But when we're faced with gentrification in that kind of way and displacement, then what happens is over time, residents who can no longer maintain uh, their place, then they leave and looking at them as repositories of legacy, then we have these libraries that over 20, 30 and 40 years have just been leaving, leaving our neighborhoods, leaving the city. And in the manufactured blight that happens from people being violently um, displaced and disrupted, then we, we, give, we give rise to a narrative that justifies demolishing buildings, which in fact have a a form of sentient consciousness about them in the way that you can go to an old building that may have real memories and resonance for you 50 years later walk in and get chills like right now bryce can go walk into the snake pit in hitsville motown recording studios walk in and feel the energy so as ancestrally rooted peoples we acknowledge that buildings and architected environments are actual containers for spiritual energy. And when we destroy these buildings, then in a very real way, a very real way, uh, we are destroying living memory as well as destroying almost like uh, extremities. We're destroying parts of our collective body that do have very real implications on the identity and how we will in turn end up interacting with our environment. Um, I'm gonna put a dot, dot, dot right there. <laughs> that was a, yeah. Yeah, no, no, thank you so much, Bryce. I think this was a fantastic answer and really also helps us understand uh, the fantastic last name that you have and this really the, the, the concept of entertainment justice that I would say you've coined. Uh, I'd go to uh, Salma now for a bit. Um, and Salma, we, uh, in the beginning of the conversation, we talked a little bit about the concept of time and the uh, the Western idea of time being linear and, you know, chrononormativity. I think about all of that a lot. I'm very interested to talk to you about your recent edited work uh, that's called We Wrote in Symbols, um, Love and Lust by Arab uh, Women Writers. 
which is an anthology, which is a collection of classical and modern prose poetry, and includes a letter from pre-Islamic era, which I believe uh, is from the ninth, from the eleventh uh, century. Uh, I'm of Persian heritage myself, and uh, really kind of looking at the the reviews that the book had and what you had in there with the stories. It kind of took me back to the stories in the Thousand and One Nights and what we call in the Persian world, uh, Bulbul Hazar Dastan, uh, which is a tale of Shahrazad and how she tells the king a story every night to save herself and other women uh, from the brutalities or being killed or executed by the king. I'd say it also reminded me of the work of Moroccan writer, uh, Abdullah Tai, uh, uh, who kind of talks about, it's a, it's a recently uh, translated work from French by Emma Ramadan, and it talks about, uh, the book is called A Country for Dying, and it talks about two uh, voices, two women voices. One is a trans woman uh, uh, of Moroccan heritage, and another is a, a, a Moroccan prostitute, Zahira and Zanuba. And they kind of delve, delve into the ideas of place, colonialism, eroticism, love, exploitation, um, so talk to us a little bit about choosing women's voices and a little bit about going back in time and your collection sort of brings all of it together. In my view, based off of how I see it, it takes the linearity element out of it as well. Well, thank you for a very, <laughs> a very deep and rich question. Um, so um, we wrote in symbols is... Um, the reason I put it together was I came across these pre-Islamic uh, poems. So this is like thousands BC, mainly from the Hijaz area, which is where Saudi Arabia is. And um, a lot of them were written by women. So women were writing in the Arab world way before they were writing in Europe. Um, and these poems, uh, some of them were like, you know, elegies to a, um, like a brother who's died in battle or something along those lines. But there were a couple of these poems which were um, poems of uh, proclamations of love or lust or um, sexual desire, which were quite forthright. And the voice was quite new to me and quite, quite modern, um, partly due to the way that they'd been translated by um, someone called Abdullah al-Uthari. And um, they just stayed with me. They fascinated me. I then came across um, later works from the, uh, there were also within this collection periods, so pre-Islamic and then Abbasid, uh, Umayyad, and the Andalusian period, which is when the Arabs were in the south of Spain. But, and these voices are, you get these really interesting women's voices during that period. And then there's a sort of, a, a moratorium there's like a, a period where there's nothing for 500 years and women aren't able there is less writing by women and they're definitely not writing on subjects of, of, of physical desire or love or lust because the interpretations of, of religious conservatism were different and literacy rates were, were not the same all the ones that existed had been destroyed or attributed to men and then these voices started building up again so from late 19th century you get women writing a little bit more about these subjects and um it also seemed to me that since what's so called the arab spring that there was greater daring in the way that women were writing about this these these subjects which are often censored and it's a part of uh, fictive writing that I'd found that I'd always slightly veered away from just because of a kind of chill factor, or a sense of being shamed, etc. So I was looking at the writers who could manage this to do this very well for inspiration. And I felt that it was a very good way to show off the best of writing from the region and also to show women uh, from the area in a, in a more heterogeneous light, you know, because it's often seen as a monolithic block of, of, of sort of repression and and the idea as the poet Natalie Handel said that Arabs don't love with a beating heart which I wanted to redress and something celebratory because nothing celebratory ever seems to come out of the Arab world so this was the idea behind the anthology and I basically I wanted it to be as diverse as possible so I had people writing in English, French, Arabic um, poems, prose, the letter that you mentioned is just fantastic. It was a recent translation and it's um, 
a slave in Baghdad raging against her master, who's a bisexual master in Baghdad in the 11th century for not sending her enough money. So she's got to sublet the room and go out and sing the lute to people. I mean, it's fantastic. So you had this this very, we, all religions, no religion to these, to these authors. And I have 110 pieces in it. And it was a great, also, I think just in showing this relationship between Europe and the Orient or the Arab world in terms of how perceptions of sensuality um, shift over time, because there were periods, particularly the 19th century and during the colonial period, where there was this orient orientalized vision of the Arab world and the East as a place of sensuousness, a place where often people of sexual minorities could, could go to to find greater freedoms. And then it it's shifted in the 20th century. And part of the reason for the shift is because of the, the, the colonial legacy of recategorizing and re-codifying um, the way that people should behave sexually and, and criminalizing certain behaviors because a lot of the co colonial legislation, which is still on the books in the same way that a lot of the legislation, a lot of the emergency laws and occupying laws in Palestine are British legislation dating back from when it was a British mandate. A lot of laws um, with regards to sexuality come from uh, the period of colonial rule in these countries. So there's a paralleling there. And it's and, and this idea of people moving from one side of the Mediterranean to the other to seek sexual freedom has sort of reversed in recent in recent times. But what I find found so exciting and looking back at the past is is a way of challenging the conceptions and the uh, acceptances of, of what is current at, at present in terms of um ways that we see as being monolithic and unchangeable are, are not. Culture is always dynamic, culture is always moving. Um, and then just a, just a couple of words about The Thousand and One Nights. It's, it's really such an extraordinary work. Um, it's, 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 nobody knows its origins. People say it comes from Persian, it comes from Arabic, there are Greek myths in it. Some of the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest stories is found within it, perhaps bits of Greek. And it's traveled. It's it's also an example of how storytelling, which is something which was picked up in the keynote, like the power of storytelling, particularly with oral cultures, it moves. And somebody who's influ influenced me greatly is uh, Marina Warner, who's who's looked at like how these folklore and these stories have crossed the Mediterranean. So for something like the Thousand and One Nights, she tracks how the way that the story is written would influence later writers like Voltaire during the Enlightenment, who could use these, these ideas of absurdity or and to mock um, conceptions of religion at the time, for example, or powers of governments. Or, so that you've got this, this adaptation and movement of the story, which is something that I was trying to bring up as well in, in the, um, the anthology. So yeah, that's a bit of it. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's very interesting that you, that you mentioned that, Salma, especially also the point that you bring about around about the oral cultures, right, and how the story moves within the oral culture. And I first, uh, I heard the story about Bulbul Hazar Dastan, the Persian version of it, where the Persians claim the own ownership of it as well, from my grandmother, who wasn't literate in any of the languages that she spoke or were spoken around her. And I heard a, a very different and unique unique version of it from her so um so it was it was amazing for me to see your work and i could see the connection between that and bulbul hazar dastan thank you for sharing that i'll come to you lisa now uh, and i was i was reading about your work uh called bidaban uh, which is uh the anishinaabe language word for first light or the first light before dawn uh, and you, you, you use room scale VR to create a scenario recalling the pre-industrial era and imagining a future where uh, nature and technology can coexist. Um, and in this world, which I think I would take the liberty to refer to as indigenous futurism, there is a strong focus on language, which I found very interesting, including showing indigenous language in the future. Um, and I was also reminded, and I was also trying to understand your own journey, Lisa, of doing this work. And you mentioned uh, in the beginning of the conversation that you don't speak the language yourself. 
Um, and personally, I can sort of relate to that sentiment because I speak about four languages and I'm on the margins of all of those four languages. And I don't, I could not say that I can speak any of those four languages very frequently, very, uh, very fluently. But there is this, there is this sense of, um, I was also finishing reading Pilgrim Bells uh, by by Kavir Akbar. If you haven't read it already, you should give it a shot. Where he kind of goes into this idea, he's Iranian uh, or, or Persian, but doesn't speak Persian. Lives in America, does not belong in any of the two uh, cultures. So I kind of was very interested and would want to hear a little bit more about uh, this idea of language uh, that you bring in, indigenous language being uh, being spoken in the future. And I just uh, uh, close my question by mentioning uh, also the work of Gunina Curtin uh, from Manitoba, who's of Icelandic and Métis heritage. And in her, in one of her poems that I read very recently, she, uh, which is called Reconciliation, where she calls herself a bridge, um, and she's kind of uh, a bridge between the Métis culture of the of the indigenous and the Icelandic culture of the settler. And she considered herself as herself as a bridge between the two cultures. So with, I'd like to ask that with your focus on space and language in the backdrop of a city like Toronto, are you building a bridge between uh, the multiple identities that you see around you and within you? And what is the significance of the focus uh, on space and language in Indigenous futurism? Thank you. Thank you. Another great question. Um, so with Bedabin First Light, I think primarily um, it extended an exploration that I had been doing about the idea of embodiment uh, as a filmmaker. And um, so, you know, I think in some ways uh, I'm of a certain age and I, I sort of have grown up seeing uh, Hollywood and special effects really become just incredible, you know, or watch Game of Thrones, watch, uh, superhero movies and you can just sit back and they wash over you and it's fantastic, you know? But I felt there was a kind of unmooring um, from reality. Um, and there was a way in which I felt in my own work that I wanted people to feel uh, something a bit more viscerally and more embodied. And I think that was a reaction to the stereotyping that so often happens, particularly with indigenous people and the idea that, uh, you know, we all know what the stereotypes are. And so as a filmmaker, I was, uh, I wanted to work sort of with those stereotypes, um, but in some ways I found uh, the most effective means for myself was to do things that were embodied. So for example, I did a short film uh, about residential schools or in the United States, they were called boarding schools where children were forcibly removed from their families by church and state run institutions. And I made it as a sort of, short musical, a kind of homage to the Michael Jackson thriller uh, video, and it was called Savage. And, the, you know, anyway, to give it away, the children jump up and they, they're zombies and they dance in this Michael Jackson thriller style dance. So it's sort of, there's basically no dialogue in that film. And then I did another film called Snare that also had no dialogue. And it was almost like a visual art performance piece where there's a commentary on uh, MMIW or murdered and missing indigenous women. And there's no dialogue, but I took women who were walking in dirt and they got pulled up like by a hunter's snare by their feet, by these ropes. Uh, so really wanting to get into something that felt very embodied. And also I thought a relevant uh, way to express strong feelings I have about this violence and these histories. So fast forward to Badabin First Light, and in thinking about this idea of a potential future and the idea of our languages as being as relevant as they ever have been, you know, and I think that um, uh, the sense that, you know, indigenous uh, cultures and belief systems uh, are not complex or they're no longer relevant, I was pushing back against that. And uh, if you'll indulge me, I have just like a couple of quotes I'll sneak in here. So one of them is by an author who uh, uh, is Robert Bringhurst. And uh, this quote is, uh, the original book is of course the world itself. People in all cultural cultures read that book, especially people without writing, especially hunter gatherers who study the great book day after day, night after night. 
people who have writing make their own books, little models of the world, and often study those instead as if their little books were somehow more correct or more important than the book in whose immense detailed pages we all live. And so I felt that quote appeals to me because it is a call to sort of be within the world and the value of being embodied within the world. And so in Badabin, what I did was I created a six minute uh, room scale VR experience, which means you put on the headset and you can actually move around to some degree within this space of a Toronto that I was saying um, was uh, rec uh, a Toronto that was being reconciled was the term I used. And I use that on purpose because there's a term reconciliation that's being used extensively here in Canada to talk about the reckoning with the indigenous uh, colonized history. And we call it you know, it's been called truth and Re we had a truth and reconciliation commission, but many indigenous people say we can't be reconciled. We need to, we need to concile. Like we've never been on the same page and a reconciliation assumes that at some point we were, you know, uh, together. And so in this case, it was a play on words because the way in which Toronto, the middle of Toronto becomes reconciled is that the natural world lives again. Right. And so, it's taken over by nature, there's plants, um, there's a turtle. So you see a place and you see evidence of human habitation as well. And it does look something like a more um, hunter-gatherer type of existence, but it's a, a poorly defined in terms of exactly what that is. Um, but what you do experience is the sound of the three traditional languages of the city, uh, which are uh, Wendat, uh, Mohawk, also known as Ganyangeha and uh, Ojibwe or Anishinaabe Moen. And those are the languages that have been spoken here. And it was playing with this idea that the languages in a way, what if the languages are connected to place? What if these languages in a way uh, that are being spoken by the land through people, right? So anywhere you go, the idea that the language evolves to describe that place, those plants, you know, the specificity of the waters and everything there, and of course, the people speak the language. So I played with this idea of a kind of almost like a spiritual decentering of the, the moment because the voices kind of evoke are these voices of ancestors. They're a bit disembodied, right? So we move through this space and... Um, I think there's, I didn't actually know how it would land. Interestingly, I will say that uh, it was challenging. It is challenging to speak about the experience because I purposely put it in a place where it was not apocalyptic, uh, which is the only word we seem to have for a future that's been, uh, that is operating within different societal, sorry, societal structures. All we can call it is apocalyptic. There is no word for uh, a generative, future where the current structures are in decay or disarray and there's something new. And so uh, what uh, I'll just leave it um, with one more quote, uh, but I think that what was generative for me as an artist was that people would go through this experience and their brain would tell them, oh, this is an apocalypse. This is a disaster. You know, some people were waiting for some dangerous thing to happen. But in fact, the experience of going through this reconciled Toronto is extremely peaceful, right? There's plants, there's animals, there's this beautiful language being spoken, and they're saying beautiful things that relate to some of the points I was, I was telling you earlier. So beautiful ideas are being expressed. Um, and so that disconnection between or the dissonance between what they thought should be happening and then the, the, the peaceful, emotional or physical experience they had was great, you know, and it, that was the conversation that I wanted to um, tap into. And I'll just read this and then I'll uh, let it go because I think we may be at time. Um, so uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the uh, novelist, uh, did I think it was a TED talk and she said something that I thought was really uh, important and speaks to like the core of what I think this this conversation is about which is like why stories are they valuable and especially as Grace Dillon was pointing out in a time of climate crisis you know why these stories what's you know um, and so uh, and I and I do think stories relate to power. So she said it is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world. And it is and forgive my I don't know the pronunciation, but Nkali 
it's a noun that loosely translates to to be greater than another. Like our economic and political world, stories too are defined by the principle of nkali, how they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. So, you know, this is why I think that the multiplicity of stories is so important. Um, and I will stop there. So that's fantastic, Lisa. It reminds me of, I, I remember the tech talk and I've read some of her work where she also talks about the danger of a single story, right? And as an immigrant, as a woman of Muslim heritage, I almost like when people ask me, what well, is this, where you're from? Is this what, is this what happens in your region? I almost have to stop myself and remind myself that if I tell them this one story, that's what they'll go away with. And then we'll get into the danger of a single story. And I think also what Bryce, you were saying about Detroit too, right? That, that there is no one single story Detroit has. There is so much happening in Detroit and there is so much going on. So the thank you for, for, for bringing that up, Lisa, the danger of uh, a single story, I think is relevant to, to all of our backgrounds and really to, to this whole conversation. And that's why we need all of us to be working towards, we need all of these futurisms because we don't want one dominant narrative and we don't want uh, one colonized narrative. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I, I, we are out of time, so I, I was going to give each one of you a minute to close, but uh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you uh, for bringing all of your ideas and um, I'll give it back to Fatima now. Thank you all. That was just incredible. And I know I'm left with a lot to think about and hope and imagine for the future. Um, to everyone and our audience, thank you for tuning in to learn more about the museum and to welcome the future with us through upcoming hybrid workshops, the Arab American Book Awards, and an artist talk between two A&M commissioned artists. Please visit ArabAmericanMuseum.org. Thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>